All right. Am I allowed to talk now? May I speak? Yes, I. I guess I have the permission to speak now. Hey, this is your host, Professor Paul Markle, and welcome back to Student of the Gun Radio. Thank you for joining us yet again this week. We've got some special stuff coming up for you guys. But before we do that, before we jump into the special stuff, I just want to uh, take care of some business. So, A, thank you for joining us yet again. Thank you guys for all the emails that you sent us this week, the Facebook posts, all that jazz. Uh, you guys out there and gals too, you folks, how's that? Does that work for you? You folks out there in the student of the gun audience are fantastic. We get a lot of good feedback, a lot of positive feedback from you folks. And quite frankly, I can't, I know you think, well, Professor Paul, you, you pay attention to everything that's going on in the world. And I try. I really do. But I can't pay attention to every single thing. And a lot of stories that we get and we drop into the show notes, they're there because you out there in the hinterlands, whether it's Washington State or Maine or Florida or wherever, say, hey, did you hear about this or did you know about that? So uh, we do appreciate that. And we appreciate everybody who stands behind Student of the Gun. And there's a lot of people who have put their money where their mouth is, and they helped us secure these awesome black carbon steel microphones and that cool soundboard that Jared's over there flipping the knobs and buttons on. And he's looking down at his, his computer very, very seriously as he prepares. And Jared promises not to type while the microphones are on this week so that you don't hear him clicking, clacking, and, and searching. Uh, but folks, this is, it's still November as we record this, is it right, Jared? Not up and yeah, it's still November as we record this. So this is your opportunity. Get back in black with black rifles at Brownells. And you want to make sure that every week you're checking out Brownells special deals on AR-15s, parts, and accessories. Uh, complete, uh, un- complete AR-15 uppers, unassembled uppers. If you're feeling froggy, you're like, I bet you I could take those parts and I could make them into a gun. Okay, you feeling froggy? Rock on. The cool thing about Brownells is let's say that you are sitting at your workbench or your kitchen table and you have a bunch of parts in front of you and you realize that you don't quite have the skill to finish putting them all together correctly. <laughs> well, Brownells has how-to videos on their website uh, that they've already done and, you know, Type in the subject, and chances are really good that if it's, you know, 1911, AR-15, high power, whatever, they've got, you know, grands, they've got it. And if they don't, you're like, well, Paul, I went to the website, and they don't have the answer to my question in their little list of videos. You know what? That's cool, too, because they have a phone number, and you can call the phone number there at Brownells. And check this out. Listen up, hippies. They will actually get a real gunsmith. They'll get a real gunsmith, and he will pick up the phone, and you can ask him. You can say, hey, I took apart my uh, Browning Model 5, and now I've got all these pieces in front of me, and I'm not sure really how to put them back in, and I feel silly. And they're very patient, and they'll say, oh, okay. (laughs) Now, they would prefer that you buy the pieces parts from them because – they actually are a business, and they have a building and electricity to pay for and stuff like that. But uh, if you buy something from Brownells and you can't figure out how to get it into your gun or onto your gun, you call those guys up, and they'll help you out. But right now, if you've got uh, a hankering to build a black rifle, you can buy a, a strip Bushmaster lower for forty nine ninety five. Um, they used to be one hundred sixty nine ninety nine, so that's like crazy discount, seventy percent off. Now, all the black rifle blowout stuff is good until December 1st, so you guys got another week. So if you want to build a black rifle over the uh, the long Thanksgiving holiday, that might just be one way to do it. So go to brownells.com and check them out. Uh, don't forget about our buddies up there at Colt, at colt.com, the makers of the LE901 rifle. You guys know that we like the LE901. We have slayed many animals with that rifle in both 308 and 556 configurations. Velocity triggers. Uh, we are, oh, we're itching, and I'm hoping today when I go to my favorite gun shop in Biloxi that they're going to have my two lower receivers so I can start doing our uh, our black rifle build, and we're going to put velocity triggers in them. Check those guys out at velocitytriggers.com. If you've got a black rifle, you have uh, velocity triggers maybe for you. Now, 
I'm, I'm vamping and I'm, I'm, I'm getting all this stuff out of the way because I'm looking through the glass case of emotion right now at Dr. Dan Olesnicki, and I just pronounce it right again. I'm going to keep doing that until I screw it up. Uh, and as you guys may or may not know, uh, Dan is the president, founder, CEO of SWAT Fuel, but that's not all that he does. He's not just uh, you know selling you supplements. He actually is a doctor. And you can't see the air quotes as I do, but I'm doing the the doctor thing. <laughs> and we're gonna talk. To, <clears throat> excuse me. We're gonna talk to Dan a little bit about not SWAT Fuel because we actually recorded the SWAT Fuel interview, so that's for another time. We're actually going to talk uh, to Dan about traumatic medicine and potentially saving your life or the life of somebody else out in the world, by the side of the road, in the parking lot, you know, out of the, in the back of the shop, uh, ho- you know, hiking up and down a mountain, what have you. Uh, it's an imperfect place, and sometimes people leak. And what do we do when they're leaking? And we're going to talk to Dan about that in just a second. Before we do that, we're going to do the obligatory SWAT fuel bump. And if you uh, are a uh, a guy, a girl, a man, a woman, somebody who's no longer 18 or 19 years old and has realized that, you know, my metabolism isn't what it was when I was 19, yeah, that happens. And you need a little extra oomph for when you're working out. Or maybe you say, I don't really work out, but – I'm a Marine, I'm a soldier. Well, if you're a Marine, you work out, and that's just the way it is. You know what, what, you know what I find funny, Dr. Dan? What's that? I'm going to tell you. Is, uh, and that was Dr. Dan, by the way. I find it funny that, that CrossFit, so you know what we called that in 1987 when I became a Marine? We called it PT. We just called it, like, going out and exercising. We didn't have fancy names for it or anything. It was just called exercise and flipping tires is manual labor yeah you know exactly flipping tires is that's people like our grandfathers actually just got up and went to work and worked all day and came home tired and so they didn't have to go to planet fitness uh and stand around and eat pizza has everybody seen that the planet fitness video where the guy's on the ab abdominizer and he's he's eating pizza as he's on the abdominizer and there's a great big planet fitness sign in the background Absolutely. You know, I'm I'm not a doctor, and I did not even say at a Holiday Inn. I'm not even a nutritionist. But I'm going to say, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that if you're on the abdominizer, that uh, that you probably don't want to be eating pizza. And Jared just <laughs> sent me a note. He says, well, you know why that is, Dad? He goes, because Planet Fitness actually has pizza day. So you go there, get your pizza, and then get on the abdominizer. And I... I <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's how you burn your calories. You're like, I'm going to eat this pizza, but I'm going to I'm going to do five crunches and that'll that'll negate the effects of the pizza. <laughs> uh, but anyway, go to swatfuel.com. That's your marching orders. They got the 40 caliber multivitamins for men or women. You know, I want to make sure you, that you ladies out in the audience and you know you're out there. Um and some Unix too. And you can Unix take SWAT fuel, are they allowed? Absolutely. Okay, so some of you eunuchs out there uh, who write me letters about how we need to be more uh, female-friendly, you, you can take it, too. We're, we're going to let you do that. But uh, the whether it's the 40 cal or the 9-millimeter fat burner or the 9-millimeter endurance formula, any of those, you say, all right, I'm excited, I want to make a purchase, you do that, stop your soul. Put in the promo code SOTG2014. When you do that, you're going to get 20% off your total purchase. And that's even more than you would get if you listen to that other podcast by that bald wrestler. So how righteous is that? Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. All right, let's talk about let's talk about medicine. Uh, we we did a little thing for the TV show, and it's going to be airing here in the uh, the near future. And we might actually just put it up on the Student of the Gun homeroom because it's pretty important. But I was watching HBO, and I actually just recently got turned on to HBO because my uh, my final edition, Zachary, the, the last edition before we stop making children, he's into the Game of Thrones. And he's been listening to the audiobooks like all 40 hours or what have you for the last year, and he's just been totally psyched up about watching the TV show. So he figured out a way to get HBO Go through his Xbox. And he's like, Dad, you gotta you got to watch the Game of Thrones with me. Okay, cool. So, so Zach and I have been watching Game of Thrones, and we're we're almost to the end of season three now. Because I don't watch regular TV, I don't watch it 
I'll watch one episode and then come back in a week and watch another one. No, I find the show I want to watch, and I watch it every single night, <laughs> like everyone else in America does. Well, the other night, Zach wasn't there, so I didn't watch the Game of Thrones. But I was poking through, and I found an HBO documentary called uh, Terror at the Mall, and it was about the, the uh, uh, terrorist attack in Nairobi, Kenya in September of 2013. And we, we've talked about it on the show. We talked about it actually right when it happened. And I told you guys out there that you need to freaking get your heads out of your butts because that is practice. That was practice for here. That was a dry run to see how that would work out uh, for the United States of America. And I'm actually very surprised that that hasn't happened yet because there's really no reason for it not to happen because there, we don't stop bad people from coming into our country. We give them student visas, you know, and just say, now, you promise not to kill people if we let you in. Oh, yeah, I, I promise not to kill your citizen. You give me student visa. Oh, and give me free money, too, while I'm here. So what do we know? Well, we know that four Johnny Jihad puke faces decided that uh, they were going to go into the, the Westgate Shopping Center, the Westgate Mall in, in Nairobi, Kenya, and there was thousands of people in the mall. Four puke faces, right? Not a squad, not a company, not a battalion, but four. Four lone, well, not lone, but, you know, four scumbags. And, uh, you know, yeah, they had grenades, which is, all right, that's fun and everything, but it's not that big of a deal. And you're like, well, grenades are a big deal. In the scheme of things, grenades aren't that big of a deal. I mean, they're, they're shocking and, and so forth. But, I mean, grenades are fun. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I've, I've thrown grenades and, you know, rock on. Uh, you know, the first live grenade? I ever threw Dr. Dan. This is this is Cold War stuff. You'll appreciate this. Back in the Cold War when we hardly had any money to train, uh, we were running around the woods yelling bang at each other because we couldn't afford blanks, stuff like that. Or we'd get one box. You, you'd go to the field for a training op, and they'd give you one box of 20 blanks for the whole op. So conserve them. You know, when you run out, you're butta butta jam, bang, bang. Well, when I, I went to the infantry school, I threw the, the blue dummy grenades. I went to, you know, I was in basic training. I threw the blue dummy grenades. Uh, when I was with the infantry, we had, there was one time we had a grenade range day, but I didn't go. I was put on gear watch or something. And uh, so the first live actual grenade that I threw was actually in Kuwait during Operation Desert Storm. That was the first live grenade. But yeah, I did it right. You know why I did it right? Because in, in, in my mind, I knew what to do. I'd thrown enough blue grenades, and I in my, my little brain housing group, I said, thumb clip, pull pin, throw grenade. And for you homies out there, all you guys, you appreciate that. And I threw it in there, and it went bang. So rock on. But anyway, I digress. Uh, <laughs> fun with grenades. Uh, and Shane, if you're out there, you know what I'm talking about, brother. So these guys start out. They throw grenades. They go in uh, two teams of two. On different levels, one one team of two goes up onto the top of the parking garage where they're having a children's cooking competition. And they walk up onto the top of the parking garage and they just open fire on the participants and the children and their families and what have you. Okay. The other two go in the front door and they start shooting people randomly. So what happens? People panic. They're running over each other trying to get out and get away. Some people freeze. They, like, just duck down and they try and hide under folding tables or chairs or, you know, things like that. I, I hate to break your heart, but folding tables and chairs are not going to stop bullets, and they can't see you. So they, they shot them. Now, I'm, I'm about to turn it over to Dan and sip my coffee, but Dan, there was 71 people total killed in that attack. 61 of them were innocent citizens. There was a few police officers that died. Uh, and there was over 150 people with various wounds. That that's, and some survived, you know, obviously some perished. But not everybody, not all the 61 innocents were killed by direct gunfire to either the face or the heart or whatever. How did those people die? Well, most of them died from simple wounds that were extremity wounds, and they just bled to death. And it's all stuff that you can take care of. Now, obviously, nobody has a first aid kit big enough for that, so you have to improvise. Mm -hmm. But the key thing is knowing how to treat the wounds and then looking for the items that you need to improvise with and make it happen. Well, it's that whole, you know, do you have the knowledge? 
And we, we talked, Dan and I talked about this uh, on the, on, for the TV show part, but there was one incident that they talked about in the, the documentary. And the documentary is about one hour long. And if you have access to HBO, this is your marching orders there, student of the gun, students. Go out there and watch it. Every American needs to watch that so you understand what we're dealing with. Because I think a lot of people, it, it maybe you do, but your family doesn't or your coworkers don't. I don't understand why. What all this is. Watch it. Okay. And there's actually even, there's like this fringe, you know, internet group. They're like, oh, the Nairobi thing was a CIA cover-up. Or I'm like, a, a what? Well, it doesn't matter who did it. It's still terrorism. Yeah, it's still terrorism. And it actually happened and people actually died. And uh, so, and, and what happened during that, it, it's a good, it's a good watch because you had people that didn't know each other, complete strangers that did, that they came together and they helped each other out. Uh, there were several saves, you know, where people helped each other. So it wasn't kind of the best of humanity. And that's what we saw in Katrina. We saw the absolute best of humanity mixed in with the absolute worst of humanity. The the most terrifying and horrible evil on one side and then the the you know complete uh selflessness and, and you know we had they had people that actually went out of their way, risked their lives to help strangers. So it it's not all horror I mean it is horrible, but I mean there were some good things that came out of that. Uh Dan we we have the pocket lifesaver, right? And we came up with it. You're you're familiar with it, absolutely. And the reason we came up with it is because people carry guns and knives and flashlights and all that stuff, and they're like, "Well, I'm prepared, man. I'm prepared." And like, okay, great. What do you do if you can't shoot your way out of the problem, or cut your way out of the problem, or you know, what do you do then? You know, people like. You know, good people can and do bleed, and it's not always a shooting. Sometimes it's a car crash, you know, a uh, natural disaster, you know, what have you. Stuff happens. Uh, what are you going to do? Most of the time it's an accident. Yeah, most of the time it's just something that happened, you know. Uh, it's a freak accident or a car crash or, you know, what have you, motorcycle injury. And it's not necessarily you. you you're just – you're out in the public and you come across something. Uh, now, Dan – as an emergency room physician, I want you to tell the students what you would like, like what you would recommend to people if they come across, you know, are they allowed to actually render aid or do they just stand back with their cell phone and video the person dying? You know, what should they do? Well, the first thing they should do is, is take a first aid course or learn on a, really what you need to do. And once you're armed with knowledge, you actually have the power to make a difference. So I would recommend first thing you should do for yourself, for your family, for your friends, is get some training. And training is the most important thing. Now, once you have the training, now you need to have something with you. You need to have some kit with you, ideally, just some small things in your pocket that you should carry. If you're carrying concealed, if you're carrying a knife, if you should be carrying some Band-Aids, and you should be carrying some kit a little bit more than the Band-Aids. Right. Well, the, the pocket lifesaver... You know, Dan, I, I think, did we talk about the kind of the impetus for it? Uh, we did. Okay, yeah. Well, we had had our students say, well, what should, what should I have? You know, I've been doing the TCCC course since 2007, teaching it. And people are like, well, all right, what should I have? And I said, well, you should get a this and get a this and get a this. And people are like, well, can we put all those in one little package? And, and you know, Jared and I, we experimented with lot with tourniquets. We were trying to get a tourniquet that was – it even the cat tourniquets are good, and you can take one of them and just slip it in your back pocket or what have you. But if you try and put that inside of a, a, a Ziploc bag or whatever, it's still kind of big. And it's, it, so, and we tried the uh, the TK4 tourniquets, which work. However, they're probably the okay. They work. That's that's what I can say for the TK4. <laughs> they're not the easiest tourniquets to get on. They're not the easiest ones to get on yourself. And that's something we do in the classes is we always make the students self-apply their tourniquets, uh, arms and legs. So 
we, we met, we did that first, and it worked. And it was like, this isn't perfect, but a TK4 tourniquet is better than trying to get someone to give you their belt and then looking around for sticks or screwdrivers or something. We talked about that in Washington, uh, Washington D.C., where the cops come up on this lady who's been stabbed multiple times, and the one guy realizes, oh, crap, she's got a femoral bleed. She's going to bleed out. And they're trying to do direct pressure and elevation, and it's not working. And he finally grabs a belt from a guy. You won't know what they first tried to do. Do you remember? Do you remember this story specifically? The guy took a shirt, cut a shirt off, and he was. And this is classic. The, they interviewed the officer. He goes, I, "I was looking for a stick or something." And people always they say a stick or something. Uh, and he said, "I couldn't find anything." Well, yeah, they're in the middle of the city. You know, they're on the street. You can't find a stick or a screwdriver or whatever. And then so finally they grab a belt, and the guy just you know, loops it through and cinches it down and pulls as hard as he can while the other guy holds the leg, and they were able to stop her from bleeding to death. So rock on. Um, Let me give you one for the shooters. Go Um, for it. Your flashlight, you can use it, and you can also use a magazine. There you go. Magazine, flashlight, uh, depending on how large your knife is and what configuration it is. You can use it. You can use it, although if you use your knife as a windlass, then you can't Can't do anything else with anything else, but... uh, so, you know, the, the TK4, it's better than looking for a belt or cutting up a T-shirt or what have you. All right, rock on. Well, then we kind of come to the next step, the, the rat's tourniquet, which actually works much better than the TK4. And you can put it on yourself with one hand. If, you know, if you practice, uh, you put it on people. And they're not, you know, not, as ex- they're not expensive. Um, now, they're not free. Uh, they're they're What's that that cute little chick from from D.C.? What's her name? Katie gets her gun or whatever. Um, she she did a show and she's like she holds up a cat tourniquet. She goes, "These are actually less than ten dollars." I don't like I don't know where the hell she's getting hers at, but those aren't less than ten dollars. <laughs> I called like I contacted I sent the the video clip to my guy my friend at North American Rescue who makes them, and I said, "Dude, when did these?" And he's like, "I don't know where she's getting them from, but." You know they're 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 inexpensive, but they're not less than ten bucks. Uh, and people say, "Well, well, I'm not paying no thirty nine dollars for a tourniquet." How much is your life worth? You know, if if you were bleeding to death, and I walked up to you and said, "If you give me forty dollars, I can stop you from bleeding to death," would you say, "Oh no, that's that's too much. Just let me bleed to death. I, I'm not giving you no forty bucks." Now, as far as tourniquets, Dan, tell the audience. Is it true that the application of a tourniquet guarantees the ap- the um, amputation of a limb? It does not. Um, tourniquets are used all the time, actually, in surgery, especially orthopedic surgery. And the limbs are actually really tolerant of not having blood flow for quite some time. So most, um, most tourniquet applications, it's accepted um, without question that for two hours, the limb can tolerate no blood flow. Wow. I, I but all right. Uh, as kind of a follow up question to that, there's still the World War II, um, I don't know, Civil War, War of 1812 advice, Stone Ages too. Yeah, the Stone Age advice that well, if you do put a tourniquet on, you need to monitor them and every five minutes release the tourniquet and then tie it back. Is that should they do that or should they just put it on and leave it alone? Well, if you're trying to let them bleed to death, yes. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. So, but if you actually want to save them don't touch it. Put it on. Make sure there's no blood coming out. And as far as releasing the tourniquet, that's my job. That's what I was going to say. Who gets to cut the tourniquets off? Uh, Nobody cuts them off. Mm -hmm. We slowly remove them in a controlled environment, either the emergency department or the operating room. All right. So here's the deal, hippies. Once that thing goes on, it stays on. You don't take it off, put it back on, take it off, put it back on. The only person that is authorized to remove the tourniquet is the doctor, the ER doc. The That's one thing, the, the one thing I will ask you to do though is, if you got a sharpie or a pen, write down the time you put it on. That's not for you to figure out how many minutes it's been on so you can release it. That's so I know the total tourniquet time. There you go. Yeah, that, and that's what people are like, oh, well, I'll, I'll write, write 3.30 on his forehead, and then at 3.45, I'll loosen it, and and I'll, I'll flush out all the clotting. And then <laughs> Yeah, please don't. <laughs> please don't do that. Don't do that. So, but, but, but Dr. Dan, 
I had an EM, volunteer EMT Bravo from 1974 tell me that if I ever put a tourniquet on, that the doctor would call me to the carpet and tell me that I was wrong. Now, as a SWAT doctor, have you had to use these and seen them used in the field? I have, yeah. And we've, we've, we've gotten numerous tourniquets come into the emergency department, gunshot wounds, what have you. And they make a difference. I mean, you, you save people's lives. There's no questions asked. So it's a proven modality that really saves people's lives, and you should use it. You'd be an idiot not to. You can watch somebody bleed to death, or you can save them. You know, we talked about it, um, you know, Miracle Max from The Princess Bride. I can fix mostly dead, but I can't fix completely dead. There you go. So they got to arrive at least alive to the ER. Uh, now, c- tell them real quick, because and, and, you're a doctor, and I've said it, but it'll mean more coming from you irreversible shock why is it so important to to stop screwing around looking trying to do all the other methods before you stop the blood from pumping out what what is irreversible shock all about well there's different classes of shock and or different degrees of shock and shock state basically means that the blood flow is not enough to support your organ function so obviously it's like an engine running on cylinders if you're running a v8 and you're going up a hill, and you've lost two cylinders, well, you might start to lose momentum going up the hill, but you might be able to make it with your momentum. But if you're only firing on one or two cylinders, you're not going to make it up the hill. And that's what shock is. The problem is when it becomes irreversible. So at some point, you get so bad, the engine is so hot that it's going to seize on you, so to speak. And that's what the human body does. So as you start building up more acid, your pH drops because your organs aren't functioning, there's nothing I can do, even if they show up alive to the emergency department, to save them. So the whole point is keep that blood in the body. Keep it in there. And we've talked about it. You can, you can give people breaths, but you can't give them blood in the field. So That's don't right. lose I, I it can, in the first place. I can place. blow air into your lungs because it's all around us, but I don't have any whole blood to pump into you. Sorry, dude. I didn't bring whole blood with me today now there there are things that we can do to get blood into the core Um, so if you are you know once you get the tourniquet on you can certainly elevate the legs and you can actually squeeze blood out of the legs into the core if if you can apply something like an esmark device which is like a big flat band-aid or use mast pants but nobody uses mast pants anymore there's a couple of devices that are up and coming in particular, one uh, that we've used, and you know, you might hear about it in the near future. But um, if you can keep the blood in there and keep it from bleeding out, get that tourniquet on. Now, the other thing, the step two is, after you get the tourniquet on, there's still going to be some local bleeding. So you got to deal with the wound. You got to pack it. Pack them, wrap them, plug the holes. Oh. So, folks, and you're like, well, oh, isn't that just for? And I'm going to give you one more, and then we're going to we're going to jump back into to guns and shooting and stuff like that. But uh, the whole, will I get in trouble? You know, will I get? Am I opening? My, if I try now, you used a term, and, and, and I'm going to let you drop it uh, when we had a phone conversation a few weeks ago about you still run into these these uh, street corner attorneys or these bloggist attorneys that want to tell you well. You really don't want to do that because you're opening yourself up to too much liability. Just just leave it to the professionals. Just, you know, be a good witness and, and that way you can, you know, tell everyone how they died. But what what is what is the genuine liability of just standing there and watching someone die versus actually assisting them? Well, assisting them, I don't think anyone is really ever gonna get prosecuted for doing the best job that you can in an honest effort to help somebody. If you're a doctor and you screw up and you do something that's way beyond the standard of care, well, that's called malpractice. So you could get jacked up for something like that. So if I, uh, if I come across somebody, I start to help them, and I do sh- such a crappy job where, as any other reasonable doctor would have done a good job, well, then you know maybe I'm guilty of malpractice. But the, the reality is that you should help them because you, there really is no downside. You're gonna, you will succeed in helping them, and nobody's going to prosecute you for that. They're not going to prosecute you for uh, you know, hazardous waste or anything like that. But if you do know what you're doing and you just watch them die, 
there's actually probably a, better, a greater liability, and that would be a deliberate indifference lawsuit. So you should, if, if you know what you're doing, help them out. I mean, it's, it's the neighborly thing to do. It's the, it's the human thing to do. It's the American thing to do. Well, that, that I, I kind of, you know, and this is the family-friendly show, so I watch my mouth. But the, the, the blogosphere and these, these like, well, you know, done it. I'm like, are you such a piece of human trash that you would just willingly stand there and watch another human. I'm not talking about the the bank robber or the crack addict that just tried to jack your family. I'm talking about you come up on a rollover car crash, you get out, and you're like, what's going on? And you see someone laying there bleeding to death. And so you just get out your phone and you record it for posterity, you know, so you can get 100 hits on YouTube or whatever. If you're that much of a piece of human debris – you're an oxygen thief, and I've got nothing for you. And I've got to think that 99.9% of the student of the gun audience actually is in the category of I would want to do something. If I see that happening, I'm going to want to. And we talk about this uh, you know, during the classes, like, okay, you have the desire. Okay, that's step number one. Now that you have the desire, do you have the education, the skill, the actual ability to do some good and with that ability education and skill do you have the tools you know did you bring the tools with you it's like i'm a master gunfighter woo and my gun is locked in a safe at home well okay i'm glad that you're a master gunfighter i'm glad that you're a a world-class national master uh you know shooter but if your gun is locked in a safe at home and you're in the kmart parking lot getting jacked doesn't really do you much good you know you can tell the guy how good you are, and in the future you will bring your gun and show him. But uh, it doesn't really do, do you any good to have all that skill if you've got nothing to start with. Uh, so, oh, we got one question, and uh, Jared just dropped this in the show notes. I'm going to ask Dan, and uh, it's uh, Zach Smith from the – is it – Jared, is it uh, Facebook? Yeah, Jared, we uh, – Zach Smith posted this question on Facebook, and it says uh, – it says, Dan, what is your advice slash instructions to get the most out of a multivitamin supplement when using workouts in day-to-day use? I, I guess it's pretty simple. Well, as far as a multivitamin, uh, I will tell you that most multivitamins will last about eight hours in your blood. And if you take um, a full dose of multivitamins, uh, a daily dose in one shot, although it will get into your blood, your cells won't absorb it. So the recommendation is that you split up your doses into three doses per day, uh, ideally, and just take it breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and that way you'll actually absorb it. It'll get into your cells much better. I got you. Okay, so th- there you go, folks. Rather than trying to uh, to power you know power it down one time, just keep it in there. Uh, you get you get cool looking highlighter urine if you do that, but uh, but that's about it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know, <laughs> there, there's yeah, if, if you're if you're peeing bright yellow, you're either a very very dehydrated and you need to drink more water, or b you're taking multivitamins. Uh, Jared Logic says, uh, "What is the percentage of gunpowder in your supplements?" Uh, <laughs> not not too much not too much gunpowder. Oh, but really, you get, Jared? You good stuff. Uh, okay, all right, <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, we hope you. Uh, you uh, enjoyed our special – boy, this is two weeks in a row that we've had special guests, isn't it, Jared? Jared, you guys are – I'm going to let Jared talk in just a minute. But, uh, yeah, two weeks in a row we've had special guests. But uh, unlike my wife, Dr. Dan is, can't tell, uh, can't tell uh, embarrassing stories on me, at least not yet. But I will add one thing. Make sure that um, if you do have a kit, uh, you have a pocket knife. Bingo. Well, you – you know, our, our students, we would advise them, if, if you're leaving the house every day without a knife on you, you're, you're wrong. So fix yourself and stop being wrong. Yeah, but most people don't realize that's your number one tool in a medical kit because if you run out of bandages, you cut up clothes. That's right. And you stuff wounds with clothes. You stuff wounds with whatever. But if you don't have something to cut it up, it ain't going to work. So make sure you have your pocket knife. Or really, really sharp teeth. One or the other. <laughs> All right, folks, let's jump back into some gun-related talk. The title of the story is Don't Mess with Texas or the Texas Gun Bill, and we want to talk about a uh, new bill. This comes to us from benswan.com. That is our source. And we are are very pleased uh, for our friends in Texas that they were 
able to uh, defeat the challenge by the hippie liberal, I guess, what do you call her, liberal Barbie chick, the, uh, the abortion Barbie that tried to become governor in Texas. Well, they defeated her, and so things are looking, th- they're looking up for the Republic of Texas. And the title of the story is Texas New Bill Declares All Federal Gun Control Invalid and Non-Enforceable. And you're like, what? Uh, Austin, November 24th, or I'm sorry, November 14th, 2014. I was jumping into the future there. A Texas legislator has announced a new bill to derail the enforcement of virtually all federal gun control laws within the state's borders. And it says, with this bill, Texas could help lead the country forward said Scott Landreth, campaign lead for shallnot.org. And you can go check them out if you feel like it later. A, uh, a project of the 10th Amendment Center. And I, I know, again, for you guys, uh, public school grads, you're like, well, what does the 10th Amendment say? Well, basically that all powers that are not granted to the federal government, specifically, not blanket, but specifically by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, are reserved for the states and for the people. So that's why if you know anything about amicus bills or federal bills, uh, if they decide that they want to reach their tentacles out into the states, they always put the term interstate commerce in the bill. In the interest of interstate commerce, we've decided you can no longer own AR-15 rifles. And uh, a lot of people have been dancing around that for years. They've said, well, if we manufacture firearms in our state and only sell them to citizens of our state and no one else, and we don't export them from our state to other states, then it's not interstate commerce. Therefore, the federal government has no business getting their nose in it. And from a strict legal standpoint and constitutional standpoint, they're right. But you know how the feds are. They're, they're power-hungry. And uh, they don't like that crap. They don't like it when you tell them that it's none of their business. But to continue on here for the 10th Amendment Center, and you might want to check that out online, uh, 10th Amendment Center advocates for the protection of states' rights. <gasps> you mean the states have rights? That's crazy. Is that crazy talk, Jared? Is your microphone on yet? Yeah, my microphone's on now. Hey, there you go. See, people were wondering if, if you were actually in the studio or if you were just phoning it in. And uh, the quote says, passage would have serious impact on the federal government's ability to carry out its unconstitutional gun control measures already on the books. And this would be uh, introduce a newly reelected state representative, Tim Kleinschmidt, Republican Lexington, House Bill 176, that's HB 176, declares all federal restrictions on the right to keep and bear arms to be invalid and not enforceable within the state. And I know some of you reasonable people out there, or a couple of you are like, oh, we, we, we can't allow um, you know, a law to infringe upon the federal government because then there'll be no gun laws. No, folks, there are gun laws. There are regulations and there are rules and you know, there's uh, laws prohibiting certain acts and making them crimes. And they're state laws. Hey, Jared, is murder a federal law or a state law? I'm going to go with uh, state law. It's a state law, right. Uh, It's against the state law. And that's the way it's supposed to be. For those of you who, uh, you know, did your research, did your uh, uh, due diligence and actually read the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the founding documents, you'll know that uh, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights are actually there to limit the powers of the federal government as opposed to what they think in D.C. is to limit the uh, powers of the people. And in addition to this bill right here, now I'm going to go down and look at the highlights. There's something else that the – who is the, the uh, governor-elect of Texas, Jared? Do you know who the governor-elect of Texas is? I want to get his name right. Uh, I, can, I can probably get it real quick here. Uh, T-X. All right. Governor-elect Texas. Texas gubernatorial election of 2014, da 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 Abbott versus Davis. Okay, it's Abbott. So Greg Abbott uh, has said that he is in favor of open carry, and he's a, he's a pro-Second Amendment guy. So it looks like during the next legislative session, which will be held in, in 2015, that if they put an open carry bill in front of the new governor, that he'll sign it. What do you think about that, Jared? 
Um, I think that it's a great idea because uh, the state should have the right to overrule the federal government. And why well, why are they why are they not doing that right now? Well, why they, is it not yeah, that they, way right now? They need to stick up for themselves. And well, you know, I I can tell you what it is, why it is, because the federal government, uh, you know, they they suck the tax money out of the pockets of the citizens of the state. They put it in their bank, in their little coffers, and then they go to the states and they're like, well, if you want any of this federal money, highway money, you know, emergency services money, development money, if you want any of that federal money, you have to do what we say when we say it. And, th- I mean, that goes back down to, you know, I, I it's, this isn't really a, a – a helmet law, seatbelt law, drinking age law deal with guns. But think about it, folks. If the federal government can blackmail the states, and this is and this is what they did during the 70s, 80s, and 90s, the federal government blackmailed the states into raising their drinking ages to 21, into instituting mandatory seatbelt laws, and uh, by and large into mandating helmet laws. And those things should have been left up to the individual states. Now, they were technically state law. They became state laws. But think about it. Is the drinking age 21 nationwide? And you're like, well, uh, yeah, it is, Paul. It's 21 nationwide. Okay, I'll riddle me this, Batman. In 1980, was the drinking age 21 nationwide? Well, I'll tell you the answer. It's a rhetorical question, Woodcock, and the answer is no. It w- it varied from state to state. Some states it was 18, some states it was 19, some states it was 21. Well, they got the idea up in D.C. that 21 was the correct age for, you know, to be legal to buy alcohol. And they basically, they blackmailed the states. And they said, look, if you don't have a 21 drinking age, we're not going to give you highway repair money. And the states are like, well, but hey, that that's our money. That money came from our citizens. Well, we don't care. We're gonna we're gonna withhold the money. Or same thing with uh, the uh, tax dollars for seatbelt laws. You know, in 1980, 85, 90, there weren't mandatory seatbelt laws across the nation, coast to coast, in, in you know all 50 states. Well, you know, uh, Uncle Sam or and I shouldn't say Uncle Sam because that's not a derogatory term, but, uh, you know, the politicians up in D.C., the big brother, big brother decided that you're too stupid to decide whether or not you should wear your seatbelt, and they're going to force the states to force you. So, yeah, it, you know, in if you're in Maine or Delaware or Montana and they have a seatbelt law, it's a state law, but the reason it's there and the reason it's in place is, is because your state was blackmailed by the federal government. Uh, you know, basically they extorted them and said, we're not going to give you highway money, we're not going to give you grant money, we're not going to give you whatever. All the money that you're used to getting, we're going to take it away from you unless you force your voters, you know, unless you put in a 21 drinking age, unless you put in a mandatory seatbelt law. And you say, well, Paul, I don't care. Well, you should care because if they can do that, hey, Jared, if they can do that with seatbelts and drinking ages and whatnot, why can't the federal government blackmail the states into more restrictive firearms laws? Why can't they blackmail the states into forcing universal background checks? Well, the reason is there's no reason they couldn't. Well, They've already done it. They've already set the precedent. They're willing to extort and blackmail the states, and they've shown in the past that they have no problem with it. But how come – why did the states let it get that far to where they need the federal funding to operate normally? Well, because they're like crack addicts, man. They're like drug addicts. They're money addicts. They they get used to spending that money every every year, every budget. They budget in that federal tax money. And then this, this was the big – and you guys out there, you smart hip cats out in the audience – who remember the crime bill garbage? It was it was a lie. It was bull crap. But they got enough people to buy you know to buy into it enough you know basically liars uh, and frauds to get on board with it. And the you know what they did was they're like oh this is 
This is the Omnibus Crime Control Act. And in addition to restricting your right to own certain firearms, we're going to take federal money and throw it at the municipalities, at the states and the cities, to hire more police officers. Now, Jared, you probably you don't know this because you weren't paying close attention in 1994, were you? No, he was, you were... I was paying close attention to other things. Like apple juice and Lego blocks and stuff like that. In 1994, Jared was play, paying close attention to uh, um, little toads and trucks and stuff like that. But what they did is they built in federal grant money to give out to these municipalities to hire more police officers. But it wasn't permanent. It was temporary. And what we and what the smart people knew, they're like, well, all right, what are these people going to do in five years, four years, six years, whenever this money runs out and they hired all these people? Are just going to fire them? No, they're going to have to replace that tax money with some other tax money. Uh, it's a never-ending cycle. And that's why when, when a state – like Texas, when a representative like this representative in Texas steps up and says, you know what, we support the Tenth Amendment. You don't have the authority to force our state to do anything unless it's specifically outlined in the Bill of Rights. So back off, D.C. So don't mess with Texas, hippies. I guess that is that the moral of the story, Jared? Don't mess with Texas? That is the moral of the Comma, story. Comma, hippies. All right. Well, that brings us right about to the end of our number one. We hope you guys enjoyed it. We hope you enjoyed our special guest, uh, Dan Olesnicki, or Dr. Dan, or Dano from Cross, or not Crossbreed. I got Crossbreed on the head because we just got a Crossbreed banner to put up in our, our studio here. But from SWAT Fuel. And we're going to, uh, we, we partnered with Dr. Dan and SWAT Fuel, and we're going to be doing a Get Fit for 2015 package. Like a, what are we going to call it, Jared? A grad pack package or a grad program package or something? He's shaking his head. Yes, no, maybe. I'm not sure. Can we um, talk? Well, I don't know. Get fit for 2015? for 2015. Yeah. Well, you're like, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, here's what it's going to contain. The uh, the package is going to have SWAT fuel, uh, 40 caliber multivitamins, the 9 millimeter uh, fat burner, the 9 millimeter plus P endurance formula, and then we're going to throw in a whole bunch of cool SWAT fuel swag like uh, extra large t shirt, hat. We got stickers? Yeah, we got stickers. We got the charger dealio. We got the car charger dealio that says SWAT fuel on it. A uh, little wristbands, all kinds of swag and cool stuff for you guys. And who's going to get that, Jared? Who, who's going to win that? One of our, who? Our grad program member? He's, he's giving me the eyes. We we mentioned this earlier, but we didn't. I thought we were going to do it to the entire. You want to do it for everyone in the world? Yeah, I would do it for everyone in the world since we have, like, a pretty big giveaway coming up. Well, for... everyone in the student of the gun world? Yeah. Okay. Everyone in the student of the gun world is eligible. So if you are, if you're signed up for the newsletter, the grad program, uh, you're um, one of our, oh, oh, and one, the last thing, if you're one of, if you've shopped at the student of the gun store. Um, you're eligible. The other thing, and, and I almost forgot to mention this. Which student of the gun store? Are you, student of the gun gear dot com or, or gumroad dot com slash student of the gun? Uh, you two tell them, Jared. I think both. Okay. Uh, no, uh, we they make SWAT fuel in the nine millimeter plus B in one dose sample packs. These little square one dose sample packs, uh, and so every order. What is the next, well, let's say, what, the next 100 orders from studentofthegungear.com? Physical orders? Yeah, let's do 100. Okay, so we just decided right there, bam, it just happened. So the next 100 physical orders, you're like, what do you mean physical orders? Well, if you order an ebook, I can't hand you something. But if you order a T-shirt, a DVD, a book, a PLS, a rat's tourniquet, whatever, any kind of physical product, from the Student of the Gun Gear store, that's studentofthegungear.com, uh, the next 100 orders will get a sample, free sample of SWAT fuel. How cool is that? So just check it out for free for nothing, just because you are a student of the gun. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we want to make sure uh, that you uh, are aware of the fact that we do have a grad program going on, and you can sign up for that. You can go to studentofthegun.com. Like Jared said, you can go to gumroad slash student of the gun, right, Jared? Yeah, gumroad.com slash student of the gun. You can go to student of the gun and click on the button there. Aha, student of the gun Click on the button. 
Uh, don't forget, we've got more stuff coming up. we got silent hunting. It's a good thing. Uh, we're going to talk uh, more about uh, our velocity triggers. We've got Fox News. Uh, Fox News agrees with us. You're like, what? Fox News agrees with Student of the Gun. Yes, they do, and we're going to talk about that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a slight break, and then we'll be right back with part two of this week's episode of Student of the Gun. 